Um, thank you. So uh, let's see here. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to have like a very short slide deck. I guess you can't really see my face that much. It doesn't really matter. The lighting is a little bit. Uh, let me see if I can fix that. That didn't really do anything. But <laughs> um, and also, you we might be interrupted by my dog at any moment. So just a FYI. Um, so yeah, I'm going to have like a very, very short slide deck at the beginning, but mostly um, what I'm going to do is uh, I'll give you a link to the this tutorial that I made um, for Latin R in this fall. So I did like a, it was, I don't know how many hours it was, but it was like a longer um, tutorial, maybe a few hours long, um, the, the, just a whole intro to H2O in R. And um, we're gonna go through that. We're not gonna obviously do all of it because we wanna keep it to be like 35 or 40 minutes. And then we'll do um, like a 15 minute Q&A at the end. Um, so mostly it's a take home exercise. Like if you wanted to go further into, into the learning, you can um, do more of the uh, exercises in this, in this tutorial. So, but first I'm just gonna tell you a little bit about what H2O is before we jump in. So, um, uh, so first of all, it's the it's the the name of a company that I work at. So H2O AI is the name of the company that I work at, and um, H2O is the name of the software that we create. And we actually do now have other uh, software that that's not just H2O. We have a couple other things. I think there's like five or six different. Um, software tools that we produce at this point, but um, still kind of the main one. And the, the um, some of our other tools are open source as well, but H2O is open source. So that's the one that, you know, it makes more sense to talk about in most cases um, to the machine learning community because it's widely available. So anyway, the, the company is has been around since 2012 and I've been working there since 2015. Um, and Essentially, we're a machine learning software company, um, and so we make machine learning software. And well, maybe I'll just say one more thing. So um, H2O is, is a platform. It's written actually in Java, but uh, we have an R API, a Python API, and that's mostly how data scientists would use H2O from R or Python. And one of the unique um, things or one of the reasons that this was created when there's obviously multiple other libraries that you could use is because it's meant to scale to large data sets and be quite fast. So it's all about like performance and speed and also the ability to productionize the models when you're done. So it's, it's really geared towards like enterprise use cases. Um, and that's, that's what the company, having a company is all about is like, um, facilitating the use of the software in, you know, to other companies. Um, and then, yeah, so uh, just a little bit more um, about the, the platform. So the way that you would use it in R is there's a package called H2O that you can get from CRAN and you just, you know, download it like any other package. The only requirement is that you have Java installed on your machine, but you don't need to configure anything or set it up or link it in any way. Basically, if Java's on your machine, it should just work. That's, you know, and after running massive like tutorials with hundreds of people for many, many years, there are lots of cases that I've seen where that doesn't actually just work right away. But we should, you know, it's usually quick to debug or, you know, something, something weird. And we've seen all the reasons why it doesn't work. So if you do have any issues, um, I'll put my um, email address, I think, on the last slide, and you can just email me and ask me. And so I already said this, we have APIs in R, Python, and there's Scala. There's also a web GUI so that you could just um, basically do any kind of model training um, by clicking around in a browser, and that's another option. And then, um, 
you can either save the models to disk in, in sort of the normal way of just saving a model to disk and loading it back in when you want to use it, or you can export the models as pure Java code. And that's one way to productionize the models. There's a, there's a couple other ways. If you've ever heard of the plumber package in R, there's, there's some tutorials about how to use H2O in production with the plumber package to set up an API for doing predictions. Um, and then one of the other things that I'll mention is if you do happen to use one of these big data platforms like Hadoop or Spark, um, H2O was built sort of with those platforms in mind because at least at the time in 2012 when the company started, Hadoop was really, really popular. And a few years later, Spark became really popular. And um, you know people still use those tools quite a bit, um, but you don't need to use those tools to to use H2O. You can just use it like a normal library on your laptop. And that's probably what most people do. Um, <clears throat> so probably the most similar library in R to H2O would be something like the carrot package. Um, and now we're getting new packages like tidy models. And I know that's, that's kind of what you guys talked about. Was it yesterday that you had the other yeah. meetup? So, um, it's sort of a meta package where you get a, a, a bunch of machine learning uh, library or sorry, algorithms, and then lots of the functionality around machine learning, like um, model metrics, like plotting, variable importance, like things like that. Anything related to the machine learning process, we also have functions for. <clears throat> so that's, if you're familiar with other packages, it's the same concept. Um, we have, you know, the same interface for all the algorithms. You don't have to learn, you know, that's what, that's, what's nice about carrot, you know, that carrot was sort of the first package in R to unify the interface to all the machine learning algorithms. And I think that's really important because you spend so much time, um, trying to fiddle around with getting everything right and remembering how to interface with all the, uh, the packages, if you just use them directly. Um, one of the differences though, is that uh, Carrot is an interface to a bunch of different libraries that are all written by different people and there's all different qualities of the algorithm. Some of them are very slow, some of them are fast, some of them, you know, have various issues. It's just, it's just an interface rather than providing the whole thing. And so one of the differences is that H2O actually does provide all the algorithms themselves as well. Um, but also one of the drawbacks of that is that we can't have you know 200 different algorithms just because they exist we have to write them all from scratch so we have a smaller um, number of algorithms as opposed to like if you use carrot or tidy models um, but we do try to have all the popular algorithms that people might want to use um, like gradient boosting machines random forest uh, deep neural networks um, glm and for unsupervised stuff, it's like, uh, you know, k-means clustering or um, other things like that. Uh, PCA, um, you know, dimensionality reduction algorithm. So we do have quite a few of the most popular ones. And um, so you should be able to find something that's useful in there for you. Um, we also have uh, XGBoost, which is like another sort of third party library that is really good for for gradient boosting um, and that's bundled into H2O and you just, there's a function called H2O.XGBoost um, that you would just use just like H2O.GBM or H2O.RandomForest, same interface. Um, so it's a nice way to be able to use XGBoost as well uh, with other algorithms. And then we also try to do some of the stuff um, that you need to do in machine learning like automatically. So, um, this is, uh, you know, for, for different algorithms, you need to do different types of data preparation when you, before you train the algorithm. So if you have like a GLM or a deep neural network, you have to do uh, like, you have, you, well, you probably should normalize the inputs um, if you want to interpret the model um, better. Um, you don't have to for GLM, but, Stuff like that we will do automatically if we think it's useful. So <clears throat> for deep neural networks and for GLM, like if you have categorical data, you need to um, expand that into either, well, one of the ways that you can re-encode categorical columns is you can do one hot encoding. Um, 
So we'll do that for deep, deep neural networks or GLMs. The, um, in our case, our GBM and our random forest don't require that you one hot encode your data. We can handle the categoricals uh, natively. Um, so in XGBoost, you do have to do one hot encoding. So it all just depends on the, the, the algorithm that we're using. And we try to make you not have to think about that too much. So um, yeah. So we just try to do that stuff automatically. And this is more, um, uh, yeah, I, I would say like if, if you're a Python user and you're used to scikit-learn, you would definitely know about all this stuff because they have like functions for every, everything and you always have to do this before you use any of the algorithms. I can't remember, and maybe, I don't know, maybe somebody on this, um, this call knows, I'm, I can't remember how it works in tidy models yet because I, I don't recall, but I'm, I'm sure there's like steps that you write out about what, what you want to do. And maybe there's some defaults as well. <clears throat> and so then there's a couple other things that I think are useful. So for, for when you're tuning or when you're training an algorithm, sometimes it's uh, easy to overfit the algorithm. This happens in particular with gradient boosting machines. Um, you can kind of just keep training and training and training and then you overfit the model and then, you know, you don't have good performance. So um, usually it requires you to plot the, you know, training error versus like the validation error and then find where they kind of start to diverge and then you cut off the training there and that would require just sort of a manual inspection of the plot. Um, so that's a step that we can kind of automate. So we have a little bit of automation in there. Um, these are all just parameters that you can tweak, but, um, like if, if you're feeling like it's stopping too early or too late, you could tweak the parameters that are related to early stopping, but we'll have stuff built in so that will help you with that. And then of course, like in machine learning, we have other things that we do, like we do cross validation, we do, we can do grid search or random search. So we have functionality for all of that. And then once you have the models, then you might want to look at the variable importance or look at the model performance metrics like AUC or MSE, and then maybe want to plot something. So we have just sort of all the tools built in for, for anything related to machine learning. Mm -hmm. um, and then, <clears throat> This is my most technical slide that I have, but I just wanted to introduce like two distributed computing concepts because this is actually, and maybe you're not going to use it that way if you're just using it on your laptop, but essentially this, this the system is capable of doing like very large um, or, you know, training on very large data sets in a distributed manner. So um, if you do have data, like training data that's so big that it can't fit into RAM on a single machine, you would have to make a cluster. So that would, that would mean you would start up several instances. And, and a lot of people would use like something like Amazon EC2 or something like that, but you could just do it on a, another um, server as well. But you would start up a few instances and then H2O would get started on all of that. And then you can load data sets into the memory that are larger than the RAM of a single machine. So then you would just have to make sure you have enough RAM across all the machines so that your data would fit in. And, and there's no limit on how many nodes you can have. Um, what I would say about this is like, don't do this unless you have to, because there is an overhead cost to having all the nodes talking to each other rather than them being just a single node. So if you can do it on a single machine, it is always better to do it that way. It's faster. So this is just a more like if you don't have any alternatives and you're kind of in the big data world and um, you do have to, to deal with that. And then the other thing I'll just say is that we have our own data frame structure. So um, we don't use the R data frame um, or like the, you know, some of the other like data table. We don't use any of the R data frame stuff. We have our own data frames. And the reason that we do that is so that we can enable this distributed computing. And so when you have um, an H2O frame, um, it's something that can be distributed across multiple machines. So if, in the case where I said like you have training data that's too big for one node, then some of the rows of the frame would go on one node, some of the rows would go on another node, and you kind of spread it out row-wise. 
And then when you're interacting with the H2O frame, it's, it's as if it's a da our data frame. You can pretty much do all the things that you can do within our data frame with the same, uh, same API. Like this, you would write the same code to subset rows of a data frame as you would an H2O frame. So we don't want you to have to learn like an extra way of interacting with, um, with data. Um, so yeah, um, it should just work. It's not like, one of the, I think, big drawbacks is that you can't use like tidyverse stuff, like functions on H2O frames, and there isn't really a good workaround for that. So um, other than kind of like re-implementing all of the tidyverse in H2O, which is, is probably not going to happen ever. Um, so one of the things that you can do is you can just write all your same tidyverse code, and then once you've gotten your frame into you know when it's ready for the machine learning then you just do a single function to convert it into an h2o frame so that you can use it with h2o so that's generally like what people do um and then you don't have to like change any of your code anyway so there's <clears throat> um yeah so i'll just mention that so that's kind of just like an overview and um i want to make sure we have time for the tutorial so this is a link so if you're wanting to um, you know, find the code for the tutorial that I'm gonna go over, we have uh, this link here. So tinyurl.com slash latinr dash H2O. And if you click on that, it should bring you to a GitHub. Let me see if there's any, okay. I have a couple other slides that are left over, but we'll just skip over to the, um, tutorial now. So I'm going to, I think I'm just sharing my keynote. So I'm going to stop sharing for one second and then share my other thing. Um, okay, so now I'm going to share this. Oh, oh. Sorry, I think I just shrunk, shrunk that. Let me see. Okay, bring your share. Okay. <clears throat> Oops, this is just refresh this. Okay. So um so this brought you to GitHub. This is just on my personal GitHub um Latin R tutorial. And what we're gonna do is there's two parts to this tutorial, and I'm just um like I said, we're not gonna go into all the steps because there's not enough time. And it's better to just work through this on your own probably. So we're, we are gonna open up the um, our Markdown uh, HTML and we're just gonna look through it. And I'm gonna kind of try to point you to all the important things to, to note about um, H2O. So, so it is broken up into two parts. So the first part is just sort of introducing any kind of like things that are unique to working with H2O. So one of the things that we'll talk about is just like data types. Um, so when you're building like a library and you're concentrated on performance, one of the things that you do have to maybe think about or is useful to think about is memory usage and how you encode the data. Because if you have like very, very, very large data sets and you're not optimally encoding the data, you're sort of like wasting space um, on your disk. So we, we wanna always um, think about stuff like that when we're, we're doing, um, especially working with big data, but you can kind of ignore it if, if size of your data is not a concern. So, um, and probably what I said just doesn't make any sense, but it'll make sense in a second. Uh, so you need uh, H2O, so just if, install the packages H2O. Um, if that uh, is something you want to do, just go ahead and do it. Um, and then you should, uh, if you want to know if you have Java or if you're having issues with Java, you can click on this link. I think this might go, yeah, to a Twitter thread that I made one time where it was in a workshop where people were having some issues. So. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, loading the library. Um, so one of the first things that you do with H2O is that you start up the H2O cluster. So I mentioned the cluster before, 
Um, really that just is the name of the Java process where all the H2O computations are happening. So that's where the data lives. That's where the machine learning happens. Um, it's sort of just a process outside of R where everything is happening. And so with, with R normally everything is happening within R and within the R memory, but um, this is just not how H2O works. So we wrote it, wrote the code in Java to make it more efficient and fast and scalable. So uh, when you do write R code, it's really just sending a little message over to the Java program and telling Java what to do and then sending the results back. And that's the way that it works in Python too. So when I run this H2O init, it's gonna start up the H2O cluster. And if you don't specify any arguments here, it'll just start up the cluster on your local machine. So you can see you print out some information. So here was the version number that when I ran this the last time, I think we're at 3.30 now, so it'll be different if you ran it today. Um, some other things, so this is just one node. So it's just my laptop, so one node. Um, the default amount of memory that we give in H2O cluster is four gigabytes. And um, if you have more memory on your machine, you can use more. So if you have a laptop and you have bigger data, you might wanna give it more memory. Um, I'm not gonna go into a whole lot of detail on that, but essentially, um, especially in R, because people are not used to thinking about these kind of concepts of like allocating memory and stuff like that. Basically just if it, doesn't work and your data is too big, give it more memory. And then like, that's the, that's the takeaway message. I could try to give you more technical details about it, but that's really all you need to know. Um, if you do run into issues, if things are not working and you're, and you do kind of have kind of bigger data, then just change um, the argument uh, to h2o init max underscore mem underscore size equals, you know, 10 gigs or 12 gigs or something like that. And this is just picking up on the fact that I have eight cores on my machine. So it's just sort of giving you a, an overview of the environment. Um, there's some other. So then to, to load data, <clears throat> the main function in H2O for loading data is, um, is called h2o.import file. And that's just basically like, like read CSV or something like that. So it will load uh, data from disk um, into H2O. And so if you have a CSV file, uh, this is like a little bit complicated code here because like first it's looking for this file locally and then if it can't find it, it's gonna like grab the file from GitHub. But generally you just put the lo location of the file if it's a path on disk or if it's something on the internet, you can just put it in there and it will load it in. And this is an efficient file like loading thing so it, it loads the data in parallel so it's all very like scalable and efficient um, if you have data already in a data frame um, in R you can do uh, a function called as dot h2o and then the name of your data frame and that will do the same thing here so um, I don't know if we have an example <coughs> of that in this tutorial but <clears throat> if you have your own data and you've already written a whole bunch of code to to pre-process it, you can just do the as.h2o to get, to get the h2o frame. So we have this data frame and um, what is this? So this is a, a loan um, default or uh, let's see, we can read more about it here. So this is the uh, a loan data set where you're trying to predict whether or not somebody um, will default on their loan, which means they're, gonna, they're not gonna pay their loan. So if you were like a bank or a lending company, you might wanna predict if somebody is <clears throat> likely to repay their loan before you give them a loan. So that's just what this data set is. So really it's just an example of a binary classification uh, problem where we have zeros and ones. Um, so yeah, the bad loan is the name of the response column where one means the loan is bad and zero means it was good. In other words, it was not paid or it was paid. <clears throat> so I think um, one of the things about tutorials is you never know like what kind of hardware people have available to them. Maybe they have like a very low powered laptop or maybe they're running it on a server. You never know. <clears throat> so we just 
we give people sort of a bigger data set with 163,000 rows, but just in the tutorial setting, we would recommend maybe just taking a subset of that data just to be quicker. So yeah, I mean, if your computer is like a MacBook Pro, you can probably just run this very easily and quickly using the full data set. If it's something less than that, you would maybe wanna <clears throat> subset the, the rows just, just because there's a lot of code in this um, tutorial to get through and we don't want people sitting around waiting for models to train. So <clears throat> I'm just looking at the time just to make sure. Um, so then this is the only other thing that I think is sort of different in H2O that you maybe not be used to. So if we have data where the response is encoded as a zero or a one, um, the way that you tell H2O whether or not you want to do classification or regression is, is you encode the response as either a factor or a numeric column. And so we just have one function for like random forest, there's just a random forest function. And there's no argument to tell it if you want classification or regression. So this is how we tell H2O what to do. So if the response is numeric, it's gonna do regression. And if it's a factor column, it will do classification. So in the case, so there's kind of this weird edge case where you actually do wanna do classification. We wanna do binary classification here, but the data is encoded as numeric zero and one. So in most cases, like if you had um, text, like if it was yes and no, it would automatically know that that's a factor and it would encode it as a factor. But because sometimes people encode their data in different ways, zeros and ones, we have to actually explicitly tell, tell it it's a factor. So we just do this one step where we say uh, data column bad loan uh, as factor. And so now um, when we run any of the functions, it will, it will train a classification model instead of a regression model. So I th I'm not sure that this is the best way of um, indicating whether or not something should be classification or regression. Other packages handle it differently, but th this is always a step that you have to tell uh, your code somehow, but sometimes um, packages will have like a little, little flag, like classification equals true or uh, other ways of doing it. Um, but yeah, this is just how we do it. <clears throat> so now we can say, we can, we can verify that, that it's a, a factor by, by looking at the levels as well. You can also ask it what, what the data the type is, but now the levels are just string zero and string one. Um, <clears throat> so let's see here. Um, this is what the data looks like. And um, these are the columns, loan amount, the term, the types here we've got, um, enum is is the is one way of saying it's categorical. That's sort of the Java word for categorical. In R, we use factor. In Python, they just there's a categorical type. So each language has its own terminology for how do we talk about factors. So when you see enum, that means it's a factor column. Um, integer and then real. So this will just give you an idea of what's in the data set. It's not that important. Um, so one of the things that you do in machine learning often is that you split the data into like a train and a test set. <clears throat> and in some cases, you also have a third data set that we'll, which we'll call the validation set. Um, we'll use that in some of the examples down here. So we just want to make uh, three pieces of the data. So we can use this function called h2o.splitframe. And um, the way that you tell it what proportions you want is that you just name like here we want to do 70, 15, 15. So 70% of the data in the train and then 15% for the validation in the test set. So here we just say 0.7 and 0.15. And the reason there's not a third there is because automatically it can calculate what the rest is. So you don't need to tell it the third piece. So you just say, you know, the first two or of, of three or the first one of two, whatever you want. So here we go. <clears throat> um, so we've got three data sets now. Uh, one thing that you'll notice here is this, the validation and the test set are supposed to both be 15% of the data. So you would imagine that they would be the exact same number of rows. 
but in fact, they are not. And so why is that? So one of the things that, that we do for efficiency in H2O is that we want every function that we have, even if you're using little data, to be scalable to really, really large data sets. So we do some, um, uh, I don't know what you would call it. I, shortcut is not really like the having the right flavor to the word, but basically like there's, there's tricks that you can do to make things more efficient. And one of the tricks that we do is we, we, um, we can spe speed up splitting a data frame by doing sort of an approximate splitting. So um, if you want like the exact number, then you should use like, um, uh, like row, you know, tell it exactly how many rows you want. But um, in this case, we don't really care. It just, it doesn't really matter if they're exactly the same. It's just, um, we just want it approximately 15%. It doesn't even matter if they're 15% or 20%. We're just making up these numbers anyway, so it doesn't really matter. So that's something I just also wanted to point out, just so you don't think it's like a bug or you're not sure what's going on there. Okay, so then I wanna skip ahead to what, what a modeling function actually looks like and kind of the API that we use. So it's probably pretty close to um, a lot of the machine learning libraries that you've seen in R, um, at least the more traditional ones in the, like the random forest package or the GVM package. So we have a function. Um, all of our modeling functions are called h2o dot something. So h2o dot glm. Um, and then we have three data arguments that you should be aware of. So training frame is like the training data. So that would be this thing that we just made called train. And then x and y. So one of the things that you might be confused about when you first are introduced to h2o is sometimes in other R packages, x and y are the actual data objects themselves. But here we actually just use X and Y to represent the columns, the column names. So Y is the name of the response column and then, or, or the index, uh, could be a name or an index. Um, and same for X, so X is just the predictor columns. So if you don't specify X, it will just assume that everything that's not the response column is, should be used as a predictor column. But just so you don't have to make lots of copies or versions of the data with different subsets of the columns. We just let you specify that separately. So I'm just showing you that because now we're gonna scroll up and set these things. So we identified earlier, like why is bad loan? That's the name of that column. And then for X, um, in this particular case, we decide to remove one of the columns because it's actually correlated with the outcome. And I'm not gonna go into details about, about that, but just know that in this case, uh, you should not be using the interest rate uh, as one of the predictor columns because that's actually um, uh, sort of hiding the, the answer in there. Uh, so if you don't know what I'm talking about, don't worry about it. Just just focus on that this is a list of columns and this, these are the columns here. Loan amount, um, how long have you been employed, your annual income, where are you from? The, these are states in the US. Um, yeah, so just other stuff like that. So this is, um, let's see how much time we have. So we have about like a few minutes <laughs> before I go to Q&A and we haven't gotten very far. So. I'm just going to show you, like, we've seen, this is what a GLM looks like. Um, all the information about the models are stored in the model itself. And uh, we use, like, this uh, S4 um, concept of having a slot. So in the fit object here, so this is the GLM fit, um, there's an at model. And basically everything that you're going to want to know about the model is there. There's, there's other slots that, that have data there, but um, you, and you can poke around and see what's in there. Um, every uh, model in H2O has variable importance um, with the exception of stacked ensemble, which is a work in progress, but um, all the regular models, you can, you can do some sort of um, just grab the variable importance. So, and that's, a, var imp or var imp plot and that will show like how important each of the features are. Um, <clears throat> to get metrics uh, on a test set, you can 
we generate all these metrics for you. So you basically just calculate them all and then you can grab out the ones that you want. So the h2o.performance function will calculate all the metrics um, for a test set. We also internally, if you do cross-validation, we would store all the cross-validation metrics in there. Um, but if you wanna just see what it looks like on a test set, it looks like that. And if you print the object, it will show you everything. But if you wanna grab out like a specific thing, then you can do like h2o.auc in the performance object and it will give you that mm -hmm. or h2o.mse or whatever. So um, this is how you generate predictions on new data. It's very similar basically to the, I mean, almost all modeling in R works like this. You have a predict function, you give it the model, give it the new, new data and it generates predictions. For us, the, the object we have in the first column, the predicted class. So it's predicting if it's a zero or a one. And then we actually have the probability, not well, these are not probabilities per se, but predicted values of, of each class. So the predicted uh, value for class one is, is here. And this is generally like the column that you would need in a binary classification. So like if you wanted to calculate the AUC manually, you would use this, um, these values here in the P1 column and then you would give it like the, um, the true answers, which are not here. Mm. Okay, so let me just mention a couple other things. Um, if you wanna do cross validation, all you need to do is tell it how many folds you want. So there's not a separate interface for doing cross validation. You just pass along n folds equals whatever. So if you wanna do five fold cross validation, what this will do is, in addition to training the main model on the whole data set, which is what we just did up here, um, like here, it will also train five fold, you know, five models um, in a cross validation setting and then store that information in the model itself. Um, and if you wanted to get the AUC, like the cross validated AUC from that model, um, you would just use the h2o.auc function, pass in the model, and you say xval equals true. That's a way to extract the, the cross-validated AUC. If you said train equals true, it would give you the training AUC. If you said val valid equals true, it would give you the validation AUC. So this is a little bit different than generating the predictions object and then grabbing it on the test set. So just keep that in mind. So the rest of the tutorial goes through like, here's a random forest. This is same interface, X, Y training frame, same way of getting the results. Um, this is, you know, now you can start to tweak things like maybe I wanna change the number of trees or whatever, um, you could do that. This is an example of plotting uh, the like training versus validation error. So this is useful to see if you're overfitting um, and here we're going to just compare the performance of two different models that we trained with like different number of trees to see if you can get a better model and we see that. <clears throat> the next um, topic talks about early stopping and so this, this is more detail than I want to go into right now but I'm going to just put this here and you can learn about it later. Um, early stopping is important I mean, it's kind of important on random forest, but it's, it is kind of hard to overfit a random forest. So it's more important on things like a gradient boosting machine. So we have a H2O GBM function. Um, so this is just showing you like the process of being a data scientist. You have to train models, you need to tune them, you need to make them work uh, well, you need to assess their performance, uh, you need to compare them to each other. Um, and maybe even look at different things, like how do different algorithms come up with different variable importance measures? It's kind of interesting to see how a GLM would think things are important versus a GBM or a random forest. Um, here's another one with deep learning. Okay, and so I just want to mention one last thing before we go over to Q&A, which is, um, if you want to do grid search, that's here. This shows you how to do a grid search in H2O. But really what I want to get down to is the very bottom function, my favorite function in H2O. 
H2O, which is called H2O.AutoML. Um, and this is sort of meant to, this, this whole tutorial is sort of meant to demonstrate how to do everything manually. Um, and it's, it's pretty intense to like train models and tune them and evaluate them and like do all this work. Um, and so part of the point of this tutorial is that at the end, we can show how to do all this stuff with one function, which is called h2o.automl. And it just completely simplifies everything that you've already done and you can just have it done automatically. And that's why we created this function. And this is kind of like the main thing that I work on these days is I, I lead the AutoML team at H2O and we develop this, this automatic machine learning algorithm. And so if you're new to H2O, I actually do recommend that you start with AutoML. Like maybe you wanna just get familiar with the interface, the X and the Y, the training frame, that type of stuff first. But then I would say one of the first things that you want to look at is this AutoML function because it's going to save you so much time. And essentially all you do is, is you put in your data, here's your training frame, your Y, your X, and then you tell it how long do you want it to train for. So you can either say the number of models you want it to train, or you can say the amount of time that you want it to train for. So that would be max underscore, uh, uh, max underscore runtime underscore seconds, S-E-C-S. -E and then what it will do is it will go and train a whole bunch of models. It will do early stopping, it will tune them, it will do a stacked ensemble of all the models together. And then it gives you a list of everything that's happened, like all the models that you've trained basically. Um, and that's in something called the leaderboard. So there's this object called the leaderboard. Uh, by, de by default, um, it will just print if you print an H2O frame, it will only print the, the top six rows. So if we want to see the whole leaderboard, we have to uh, um, pass along n equals number of rows. So what the leaderboard is, is just a data frame that contains the model name or ID and then the performance. So it, by default, it'll, it'll give the five-fold cross-validated performance. So this is five-fold cross-validated AUC. And then it just ranks all the models. Uh, by by these different metrics. And so we're doing binary classification. So by default, it's going to rank it by AUC, but you can change that if you want it to rank it by log loss or something else. That's just one of the arguments to the AutoML function. So here we see like, here it's trained to stacked ensemble with all the models. That's why it's called stacked ensemble all models. There's another one where, where we call best of family, where it just trains the best of each group. So, or it, sorry, it makes an ensemble from the best uh, model from each group. So the best XGBoost, the best GBM, the best random forest, the best deep neural net, and the best GLM. So a smaller ensemble, which is sort of meant to be used in a production environment. If you, if you don't want to have like a 300 model ensemble, you can have like this more lightweight one. And then it just has all the other models that it trained. Um, and here we only ran it for like a little bit, so it didn't, didn't actually, um, finish doing all the things that it could do. So it could train, uh, more deep learning models. It could train more, uh, GBM grids. We didn't really get very far. So I would recommend, um, running it for like at least 20 models, some like maybe 50 models if you, if you have the time. Um, so that's. It's probably where I should stop because I think I'm already a couple minutes over my time. So um, there's longer tutorials about AutoML and I, and I want to um, just tell you that you can click on some of these links and it should probably bring you, uh, this will bring you to the user guide where you can learn more about AutoML. Um, here's all the options and then here's some code examples here and it will tell you more about like the algorithm um, below. Like, what do we do? Which models are we training? What are the objects that you can get back? There's sort of a, a log of everything that happens. So it logs, like I trained these models with these parameters and then I did this and um, here's a list of all the models that we train. And yeah, so I think um, AutoML can be used as, as a, just a way to speed up your, your coding or your workflow or it can be used to generate kind of a baseline for what's possible on a new problem. Like if you have a new data set and you just, you know, 
you could either spend a lot of time trying all the different things or you can just run AutoML and have it try everything for you. And then you can kind of see where to go from there. So if you see it's doing really well on GBM models, maybe then if you're an expert on tuning GBMs, then you can kind of look at what's worked and what the hyperparameters are. And then you can maybe tweak it further if you have um, you know, skill in doing that, or you can just take the model that it gives you. Uh, um, the models that we give you. And you can choose any of the models on the leaderboard, but um, yeah, and it's, it's ranking them so that you can um, uh, choose the best one. And you can also rank by other things. I didn't go into detail about that, but you can rank by like the training time or the prediction speed. Prediction speed is quite important for people if we're putting a model in production. Um, so we have another function that will create what we call an extended leaderboard that adds other model metrics. Um, not just like AUC and MSC. So other things that you might use to choose which model you want to actually put into production or use. Okay, so I'm going to stop there so that we have time for, for Q&A. But, um, you know, I tried to cover a lot, but this is more of like a taste of, of H2O. And then hopefully if you want to go further, you can do the, the Latin R, the whole tutorial. And then I would also encourage you to do like I think um, I was gonna just search tutorial. Yeah, there's a link from the AutoML uh, user guide. There's more tutorials on GitHub that you can go through. Um, yeah, here. So, <clears throat> okay. So yeah, I think that's uh, it. And I will uh, take whatever questions people okay. have. Thank you. It was 